All right, everyone. Welcome to the first Facebook Live edition of Broadish, where four broads chop things up and dish things out. I am Jocelyn Chia. Felicia Madison. Holly Harper. Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. And today, of course, we're going to have to start off with the talk of the town, the shit show masquerading as a presidential election yesterday. That was not a presidential election debate going on. That was a man-child bullying another man and a teacher who couldn't control him. It was embarrassing. I think uh, that one of the people on uh, CNN said it best. He said, uh, that was a hot mess inside a dumpster fire inside a train wreck. Jake Tapper said that. <laughs> and um, and someone else uh, on uh, CNN literally said the word shit show. And I don't <laughs> think they're allowed to say that on PBS or MSNBC. So maybe CNN is the edgy comic. I, I was just screaming at the TV and then I went away for a half an hour and I came back and I started screaming at TV and then I drank some brown liquor. Like, at first that. I thought it was very funny. In the beginning 10 minutes or so, I was like, this is funnier than any Netflix special I've ever seen. It was like an old married couple at couples therapy. But after half an hour, I was like, okay, this should have been a five minute late night set on the Late Late Show and not a 90 minute special. It was kind of like someone saying, come with your tight five. And someone just said, I'm gonna just rant from my notebook instead. Yeah. <laughs> that person should never get booked again. Never. I can't remember laughing. Like some of the things that were going on, I can't remember laughing so loud watching TV. Like <laughs> you were, you were like on my page, like I can't stop laughing. I was like, I'm screaming at the TV. But what, <laughs> what were you laughing at? I want to know. It was a combination of laughing and also just, I was so nervous because I just kept praying and I don't believe in God and I'm not a religious person, but I'm like praying as a joke to Joe Biden. A, don't lose it. And B, don't have a heart attack. <laughs> I think we just need to finish this without him dying or yelling. And he lost it a few times. I have to he say, he, he called him a clown. He told him to shut <laughs> that up. Was, that was my favorite moment of the whole night. I was like, <laughs> well, thank well, you. The other, the other thing I heard is that they called it a circus and the people in the circus were complaining that they run a much better show. <laughs> <laughs> the people in the circus only abuse animals. They don't abuse humans. So <laughs> I give props to the circus people. Joe Biden is talking about, you know, he wants to shut down this country, da da da, and Joe Biden will be like, let me shut you down. <laughs> and when the moderator is just trying to calm the president down to get him to stop talking, he's like, well, I, I, I guess I'm debating <laughs> not him. I, I suggest for the next time um, that they have a mother moderate because they needed yeah. a mother going, you're gonna get time out, that's it. <laughs> Go to the other room and when you're ready to behave, come back. And he obviously has mommy issues, Trump. So I think he needs like a Good strong one. motherly figure to tell him, you know, just you gotta behave. It was just, they were babies. Like I saw someone posted a meme where he had like a baby face on. I mean, th like one of the times I really laughed is when they were telling him to shut up and he's like sitting there and just like, <laughs> He's like mouthing it and just like he couldn't mouthing the words that he can't speak through. like not, <laughs> he couldn't control himself. He was just he couldn't he was like it was it was it was comical and and some of the things that he said like he started attacking Joe Biden on where he went to college. Yeah, and his grades, which I thought was just such a low blow. Like, give me a break. Like, give me also, a break. also Trump paid someone to take his SATs. He had to transfer into his college because he he couldn't get in the kind of real way. Um, he uh, he won't release his college transcript, so we he could have just gotten all C's. Uh, Trump uh, likes to when he does this kind of attack, like you're dumb. It means that's his insecurity. Trump yes. is so insecure about. And so another moment that I thought was really fascinating when. Joe Biden is talking about his literal dead son, who's a war yes. hero, he's an Ooh. attorney general, and then Trump interrupts him and says, well, what about your one living son? Isn't he a cokehead? And I'm like, he didn't say cokehead, but you know, addicted. And I'm like, zoom in on Don Jr. and Eric, because- I was like, gum, let's talk about your garbage ass kids. Like, yeah, your, their gums are receded from doing coke. Like <laughs> those, those cokeheads, uh, are are like active Coke users. At least Hunter has gone into recovery and is trying to make a new beginning. That was 
seriously disgusting. Like, yes. imagine talking about your kid that died and another one that almost died from addiction, and some guy is like, your kids are s sucky or whatever. Trump's like, coke-ass kids from the 80s. Like, his kids got nothing. The 80s got nothing on those, on those Trump kids. Like, they're just... They're horrible, horrible, garbage ass children. And I was like, you're gonna talk about somebody's dead child? I was like, Lord have mercy. Like I'm watching a debate, I was like, I wish he was debating Portia and Nene. You know what I mean? Like from the Real Housewives of Atlanta, because I just wanted someone to check him so hard. First of all, he had so many things wrong with him. Did you see the, um, the facelift tape in his hair? Yeah, I saw that. There was like, there's some tape right here. Oh. Yeah. Don't have facelift like, tape trying to talk about me. No, yeah. no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not going to have a tie down to your dick talking about me. You're not going to have facelift tape. You're not going to have all these things, and I'm not going to throw a little bit of evening shade your way. I, I've said this before, but I think the only person that could have handled him would be um, Ma Maxine Waters, because she would have snatched his edges, because we know whatever that is, is a uh, half human, half primate on his head. And she would have done it metaphorically, not with violence. But <laughs> the funniest part was, you know, maybe Trump has mommy issues, but Chris Wallace's dad is Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes. And Mike Wallace was an absentee father by all accounts, and Chris Wallace really credits his stepdad for raising him. All his daddy issues about Mike Wallace pretty much came out there. He's like, oh, uh, Mr. President, you'll like this next one. It has candy. I know. I was like, oh, Mr. President, like, oh, oh, look over here. I'm going to ask a good one now. Oh, oh, oh. It was so clear. Shameful and shameful. So clear that he needs to, like, go to therapy and work on boundaries. I mean, it's it was so sad. Yeah. I, I just felt like we needed somebody's mama because I, it's crazy. Like, like when I start watching these debates and the way he's so rude to him, I was screaming at the TV like, close your mouth. And like giving stuff that I'll give to my kids, like when my mouth opens, your mouth closes. <laughs> when my mouth opens, your mouth closes. Like, uh-uh. I would not he needed to be treated like a hostile witness. That's how he needed to be treated. To be on Zoom so we could mute him. Yeah. Can he use the word Pocahontas again? Did you hear that? Yes. He did. I was like, we gonna start the night off with racism? That made me laugh. I'm like, he just said Pocahontas again. Like, he doesn't learn. Pocahontas! And, and then, to get a little serious about this on CNN, they said that there were three things wrong with the debate. One, he Only couldn't three. say the word white supremacy. Two, he couldn't say the word white supremacy. And three, he couldn't say the word white supremacy. I mean, I was there with my whole family, <laughs> and we all were like, he... He, he would say it. He like literally would. And then he went and, you know, said, you know, stay back or lay back or whatever it was to yeah, the. Yeah, stand by. He oh, said, stand, stand, he stand, said by. stand back, stand by. So he like was the saying, commander of the yeah. white supremacist. Stand by, boys. We're going to yeah. go to bed. And within 10 minutes, they were selling those stand by and stand uh, back shirts. They were, stand, they were selling those shirts. Yeah. And that just kind of shows a lot about Trump because what he does, he likes admirers. He likes people no matter who they are or what they represent. He likes his base and he likes to pander to them. And he knows that these are the people that are his base. And he couldn't, he was saying all these things about, you know, Joe Biden couldn't, you know, downplay the police because he, he would lose his base, but he's doing the same exact thing. It's worse than that. It's not just that he likes people who are white supremacists supporting him. He literally is a white supremacist. I mean, he is. from the Central Park Five uh, days to when he's talking about, uh, you know, he's basically like evicted uh, black people from his properties. He's done unfair practices and not giving housing to people of color, especially black people. He I'm literally- It's the casino, the casino. He didn't even want black people on the floor, like working on the floor. Right. That's disgusting. I think he doesn't know the meaning of the word white supremacist. <laughs> he when knows. First, when they first, when Chris first asked him, all right, the nouns, white supremacists. He went, sure, we denounce white supremacists. Sure, okay, do it. Stand back and stand by. He that was funny. That was a funny moment. He was like, 
Like looking around for a second, like, yeah, we're watching you, dude. We're waiting for you to say something. Can I get a line? Can I get a help from the outside? It was like he was. He was like a little like. Oh. Can I get a lifeline? Can I get a vowel? Yeah. There are consonants you know, in it. Joc- Jocelyn is 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 partially correct. Like he doesn't believe in this idea of white supremacy. When he hears it, he thinks, "Oh, you're you're just calling." Uh, people racist and that's wrong like when he talked about racial sensitivity training he's like oh they're making people in a certain group which means white uh you know learn about things of what it's like to have nothing how terrible so what trump is saying is in these sensitivity trainings they got white people and people with privilege to role play and see what it was like to be black in America or a woman or a person of color or an immigrant. And that is demeaning for him. Yes. So Trump doesn't understand maybe words. He doesn't understand how they work because he just says like beautiful billions, whatever, over and over again. He doesn't even understand the concept of racism because he thinks it's socially acceptable that certain groups are beneath him and below him. Like if he's saying that about the military, suckers and losers, what do you think he says about people of color, immigrants, black people, women? He's like a thirsty little racist fourth grader, like straight up. His language is that it's a fourth grader. Do you guys count how many times last night he kept saying by the likes of which nobody's ever seen before? (laughs) That should be a drinking game, like by the likes, the greatest, no one's ever seen, you'll never know by the likes, it's just like, Every, you can't, everything can't be big. You know what I mean? If everything's big, nothing's big. Like everybody can't be cool. If everybody's cool, no one's cool, you know? Well, what I, on a bigger scale, like I, I was watching the polls and what was interesting is it wasn't like Biden's polls went up. Uh, it's just that Trump's numbers went down. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh. so he really lost a lot, but Biden didn't really, like someone said, Biden didn't win Trump loss um because biden didn't rip into he didn't get up in that ass he was killing people at home people were like when is he gonna get up in that ass it was hurting people like i could see it people were just like oh oh all these things he was letting just fly by fly by and he wasn't checking him and that's why trump was losing and he was not winning i felt like biden like he just didn't seem to have like a strong voice like like you were saying i wanted him to like and it was, I thought he looked a little tired and old. I was like, yeah, these comedians coaching him on how to handle a heckler. Absolutely. I 100% agree because if you've ever been at a club and someone is constantly interrupting you, you, you don't have the rhythm, you can't do your delivery right, you can't even get to the punchline. You have to get rid of the heckler so you can get back to your set. Mm-hmm. Um, you need a bouncer for the presidential election. <laughs> Uh, but if you bounce him, then it's just basically an interview between Chris Paul and Joe Biden. Like, why so even have- the penalty you get for going overtime. <laughs> your point, or your opponent gets the phone. So we can mute him. I mean- we can mute. <laughs> Yeah, well, the thing is that Trump will never agree to some rule that makes him seem bad. He agreed to it, he just breaks it because he doesn't think rules apply to him. Exactly, so there's no way of reining him in. I do think that if there was a mom, uh, like if it was Gwen Ifill, rest in peace. Yep. If it was someone who had, you know. Joy Reid. Joy, Joy Reid would Joy not Reed. let that happen. Joy no. Reid, but Trump would never agree to have Joy Reid. Oh no, he would never. Yeah. Some he, he, just needs, he just needs a tiger mom. Okay, he needs a tiger mom to be like, you shut the fuck up, I thank you. That might turn him on. <laughs> but I can he, he needs someone to tell him to shut up. Yeah. You see so much, like it was killing me that there were so many things that Trump was saying that I could see Biden have, he could have opportunities. This is where, like, you know, being a black woman comes in and women do this on the whole period, but shade. You know what I mean? Like light shade. Like he said something to be like, you know, I, I'm the one who built America, destroyed it. You know what I mean? Just kind of like, because yeah. that would throw him off. Just to be like, I, that no one's ever, what, never seen before. Oh, okay. Never, yeah. <laughs> like, just like, and the thing is, you don't need all the energy to bring light shade. I love light that. shade from the side is, is dismantling. It I is love disrupting. that. Biden needs I love- shade from Holly Harper. I love it. <laughs> I know like many it. women that could do light shade though. Bravo is full of light shade. Light shade, evening shade, heavy shade, shade. 
<laughs> Light shade versus orange shade. I like this a lot. In addition to a mom or a person of color, uh, I think a queer person could also do it. Billy Porter. Yes, they could. Yes. Billy Porter would be a great moderator. He would not let some of this stand. So. Um, the next one does have um, Kristen Welker, who's a woman of color, but then there's a, a white guy, and it's the town hall format, which if you remember in 2016, Trump got up, stood behind Hillary Clinton, was pretty much like breathing on her neck, and she's like, what is this? And he physically used his body to intimidate the Secretary of State. He's gonna do something else, even if you cut his mic, lower his volume, get him to, he's gonna do something else that is disgusting to be able to throw anyone off, off track. It's, it's crazy. He's just he's just bad news. And there might not be a next debate. Joe Biden has agreed to doing oh. all of the debates. And the Commission on Presidential Debate says, uh, we are going to look at all the input and make sure we take your feedback into consideration for the next one, which, uh, which they, they're going to try to do. But again, with someone that's like this, you can take into consideration, but he's just going to do something else, quote, unprecedented, and then mess things up. So for Joe Biden, there are a couple of things that I thought were going on. One, he fell into the Democratic trap of Al Gore and John Kerry, where they were rolling their eyes and sighing and being like this clown over here. Once or twice, like Holly said, once or twice, I roll shade is okay. But if that's kind of your go-to, then it just becomes like, wow, this guy is really getting thrown off. So you can't yeah. do it too much. You can only do it a Don't little play bit. play defense. Play offense. Right. Never play defense. You lose when you play defense. And they right. say that Biden should be good at that because they talk about how he was used to being bullied and he's an underdog. And there were so <clears> many <throat> things he could have said, so many missed opportunities that he could have, like, fought back at him that I feel That's like he was, he was talking oh. a little bit from his playbook and not being like, that's what we want him to do because Trump has been bullying us for, for four years, right? But amongst undecided voters, undecided voters, the same reason they don't like Bernie Sanders is the same reason they don't like Trump. And I know that they're different and I know it's, it's not a good analogy for people who live in coastal cities, but they don't want any more yelling. Undecided voters see both sides. I can't see both sides. I only see one side that's a dummy and one side that's gonna save democracy. So undecided voters uh, tend to be people in these swing districts in the heartland of America where they don't, like they're not New Yorkers. They're not yelling at each other uh, about things like, you look nice today, or thank you for that bagel. Like New Yorkers are just loud. And so they're not coastal elites. They're people who are like, I want someone to be to be, you know, talking about issues. And so for that that demographic, Joe Biden actually did too much. They didn't like that he stooped to his level and undecided voters said that. So what we want Joe Biden to do is not what's going to get him swing voters. I, I don't want him to match that energy. I want him to bring the little evening shade because we have like housewives, women, wives, moms in the burbs, they've been watching Annie Cohen with the Real Housewives at every goddamn where for the past 12 years. And they know shade when they see it and they hear everything. I think the only thing, unfortunately, that's gonna solve this and the thing that really makes me upset is he is, and I think everyone's agreed that he's been, he has had no decorum, he's not presidential, he does not act in any way, shape or form that anyway. uh, we would want. And I find it embarrassing that the Republican Party uh, can't look at this from a moral perspective and, and turn and say, listen, this is not, I mean, they are supporting him. You know, I, I was talking to m my husband about this, saying how, you know, when is this going to happen? I mean, what if we're overtaken by white supremacy? Well, the thing about the Republican Party is, is yeah, this is the scummiest thing in the world. That they claim to be this party of values and all this, all this time. I don't ever want to hear a damn thing from the Republican Party ever again about any kind of values. We know what kind of values they have. Yeah, this is the first time in my life that I've regretted choosing American citizenship over Singapore citizenship. I wow. 
you know, wow, I'm embarrassed. To, someone has to put their foot down and someone has to say, this is not right. And they're not. It's the voters, you know, it's the voters that have to put their foot down. We are the last guard here of Americans, America's democracy. Yeah. And I think, but I feel like yeah. Democrats need to double down on the petty. Like we need to be petty goddamn Davis. You know what I mean? And never, ever let the Republican Party uh, be in any kind of control because we know they don't have any moral backbone. They have no backbone. And if God, you know, if they're given a chance, they will destroy this country. So I feel like it needs to be a type of thing with black folk, with women, with Democrats, with, uh, with everybody, except these mofos, never again with these people. Never let them have, like, we need to squash them. So I'm staying in Portland right now, right in the heart of the anarchy yeah. of America. And Trump had said that the Portland sheriff supports him. And the <laughs> sheriff went on Twitter to be like, no, I will never support him. <laughs> oh, wow. Vain in vain. I do think that the majority of Americans want something good. Like more people voted for Hillary Clinton uh, than they did for Donald Trump. But the way the electoral college works, the way that the Supreme Court appointment works, it's pulling the country to the right when we actually have a center left country. So our institutions are extreme and the people of America really want to do the right thing. Um, and so I feel like that's why uh, it's such a difficult thing for voters to exercise our right, because we can sit here in New York, Portland, San Francisco and exercise our right. But it's really that voter who, you know, doesn't buy organic and goes to Walmart and drives their car around. And maybe they have a sick mom in the hospital, so they haven't been paying attention to things. And they believe things like, oh, Hunter Biden must be bad, so it must be on both sides. So they're, they're the folks that we really need to reach. And I, I am not the person to reach them. I, I don't speak that language. I don't know how to do it. Well, that's why the Republican Party has to stand up and speak to their people and say- They're not going to. Yeah, they're not going to, but it's the moral thing to do. I mean, the Lincoln Project did. The Lincoln, the Lincoln Project's videos are damn good. Just yeah. so fascinating that Kellyanne Conway's husband works for the Lincoln Project. And, I know, and he's as Republican as it gets. He's right. extremely Republican. And he's the moral he, Republican. Yeah, but he's like, I'm. It's about fiscal conservatism. It's not about proud boys and racism. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. Like I do when when George Will four years ago was like, this is not my Republican Party. I was like, oh, mm. George I'm Will comforted. is not with you guys. I am comforted by the argument that when we lost our first election, when Trump won, that it was the Bernie Sanders. Um, supporters who refused to, to vote because couldn't, they couldn't get Bernie in the office. There is no way they're going to stand by now and, and exercise their, their right of, of dissenting by not voting. Like They can't tolerate another four more years of Trump. So my hope is that the Bernie supporters are going to cast their votes for Biden so we can get out of this hellhole. But, you know, to change the subject a little bit to the Supreme Court, because I think I found it very funny how he's so persistent that he wants to do it. It was almost defensive, like he knows he's not going to win. I, yes, and he's like, I need Amy. Amy's yeah. going to throw out the votes. I was like, oh, because that's how it works. We just appoint people to negate the American voice. That's that's what it is now. Like, what? <laughs> like, he, did, he said that quiet part out loud. Like, he said that out loud. Yeah, we'll, we'll get rid of the votes. But the we'll get, we'll that, throw them out. One thing that was said that I didn't appreciate that I was a little confused about, but what made a lot of sense, is the reason why the um, Republican Party didn't want Obama appointing someone is that he was on his way out, meaning he definitely couldn't be president. There were going to be two new candidates and one of those two should decide. And Trump's saying that I'm still here. I have another three months or whatever, and I might be here again. So that was a little differentiation on the Republican Party that it, it makes a little bit more sense to me. That's post facto, though. That, because yeah, that's, yeah. That's not what they were saying at the time. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Graham said, get me on tape. Mark my words. Yeah. If this happens when there's a Republican, this is. And so they added those loopholes afterwards, which is another, frankly, it's a white supremacist thing because it's always about like white supremacy when, when it's like, oh, we want immigrants to come, but you can't do this. Oh, we support black people, however, and this goes back to Jim Crow, it goes back to slavery. There's always this, this, like, this hope that's dangling and then they like 
pull it move away. Move the goalpost. Yeah, move, move the goalpost. The goal post. So that's, that, that's very much in line with their thinking. And Lindsey Graham is, uh, I don't know what they have on Lady G. I don't know how they many. Got they got Lady G on Lady G, girl. You know what they got on Lady G. I know. I don't, you know. don't know. I don't. I. I want to know more. Actually, I want to know more. I want those gay guys to come out and be like, "Look, we can't. We can't have this horrible image in our heads. So we want to share it with you." So, they need I to want pull a Andrew. They need to pull an Andrew Gillum on Lady G. That's what they need to do. I know. So there's something that's holding that everyone is has on these people, and we kind of know what it is with Trump. He owes a lot of debt to foreign countries. And mm -hmm. so that debt is going to come collecting. But what do they have on Mitch McConnell? What do they have on Lindsey Graham? What do they have? Like, I I'm not I think Russia. Russia, yeah. too. I I'm not big into conspiracy theories, but I, I think that to be able to, they might be just afraid that if they speak out against Trump, they're going to lose their election in their, in, their, in their districts because running against Trump has hurt more people in the Republican Party than it's helped. Like Jeff Flake was basically like, I'm out of here, right? So they're afraid for their reelection. Yeah, but and it's time for them to think about something other than themselves. It's time for them to do the moral right thing. Yeah. So it yeah. is, but we know that's not even why they're even there in the first yeah. place. They're, you know. But think think about it this way. Comedians never do the moral right thing. Like if you know that there's like a sexual harasser who's performing, how many comics will use their voice to say that guy is bad or I'm going to speak out again? No, they want to get booked again. They want to book that late night spot. It's just like that with these senators. They just care about their job and getting the next spot. Like nobody is going to work in the best self-interest because since the Reagan years, we've become a self-centered country about me, me, me. And it's created a generation of boomers who are just about themselves. And Trump is creating this generation of people who are like, uh, no, having no empathy is good. So I, I don't think that elected officials seek office for the good of the country anymore, because if you look at the, the, the House of Representatives, they've been gerrymandered. If you look at the Senate, uh, people like Mitch McConnell from Kentucky have more power than Kamala Harris from California. Like it's a it's an imbalance that uh, it's not going to it's not it's not going to help anyone. My favorite part of the whole debate was when I posted on Facebook a joke. Oh, because you know how um, Biden had called Trump, you're Putin's puppy. And so I put yeah, oh, yeah. hashtag yeah. Putin's pussy. Oh, typo, <laughs> hashtag Putin's puppy. And my dad shared it on Facebook. And then one of his co-workers was like, oh, your daughter's a comedian. I have jokes for her. <laughs> oh, no. Jocelyn, what I love about that is how much your dad loves you. Because <laughs> no, you know, right? didn't he start forwarding your videos to like all the aunties in Singapore? Like he, he loves did. you so much. <laughs> but by the way, speaking of the Supreme Court, what do y'all think of Amy? At first, at first I thought I was just gonna hate on her, right? Anti-abortionist, anti-Obamacare. And then I real and I found out that this woman has seven children two of whom are adopted from Haiti. And I was like, oh, she's the OG Angelina Jolie. She's Sarah Palin with a law degree. I think she's <laughs> full of shit. And I think those Haitian children are props. I'm sorry. It's, it's possible to have a loving heart and want kids and to want to treat them well. But just because you have black kids doesn't make you anti-racist. Strom Thurmond- Thank you. Strom Thurmond had a black daughter and he was the most racist. What? Thomas Jefferson had black kids. Let me tell you something. In the black community, uh, we see these stories. Hmm. We see them and we talk about them to ourselves and we know or we know what we think who is full of shit. And this whole idea that you, because I'm married to a black man or I have black children or whatever the hell makes you not racist is bullshit. Why? And for someone like Amy Coney, Amy Coney Barrett to be like, I find her so offensive as someone who is like so anti-abortion. And when I, when I see her, I see Mass's wife because 40% of enslaved Africans were owned by white women. And those white women, those like myths of the house, so many of them used to track the enslaved, the, the enslaved African, they said track their cycles and know when they were supposed to be bleeding and then matching it up with so-and-so and you two have to mate and you're gonna be sold off here. I don't trust that bitch for nothing. 
thin. And she ain't nothing but Sarah Paulson in 12 Years a Slave. I think this is an important feminist point. Like, just because someone's a woman doesn't mean she's, like, I, I think there's a saying, like, uh, skin folk ain't uh, kin your folk. Kin folk. Yeah. All your kin folk. Yeah. Fo all your skin folk ain't your kin folk. Is uh, there one uh, that we can use on women uh, just because you're, you know, like. All your that? pussy folk. <laughs> In your... What about how Trump was responding? Like, oh, there's nothing on the, the docket about Roe v. Wade. There's nothing to worry about with Roe v. Wade. We're not going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Yeah, sure. Sure. Like, get out of here. That's the whole point. That was the whole point of her. That was the whole point. Because it was like, it lets men off the hook. It's like, well, I don't have to bring a man in to say that women can't have abortions. I bring in a woman. It's so I... sneaky. And it's so calculated. Yeah, uh -uh. I mean, she is no Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She is as much the same as RBG as Clarence Thomas was a Thurgood Marshall. Yeah, Thank you. that's 100% right. I, I think that like Sandra Day O'Connor was really, really smart, very intelligent, did a great job. So, you know, it's it's almost feminist because it's like now we can have someone as bad as Clarence Thomas, but is a woman. So it's allowing, <laughs> it's allowing women to be completely shitty, which maybe in some long term thing, it's good. Because wouldn't you guys like to see like a really shitty female comic bombing all the time? And they're like, we're going to give you a show on Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. And then she's out there grabbing guys butts and stuff like that. <laughs> And then nobody, nobody speaks out again. Like, I want to see shitty women succeed like shitty men succeed. <laughs> well, one thing about Amy well, Coney Barrett that, I know. Well, one thing about Amy Coney Barrett that confuses me is that she's all into this thing of it's like, men are the heads of their household and women have to defer to their husbands. If she's so sub, uh, servient to her husband, then what place does she have ruling over men at all? Why should she even be in a position to decide on cases where men are involved. Right. And she's still on this whole thing of women obey men, the bitch stay home. Stay home, keep your well, mouth shut. No, she has stated that her marriage to her husband is very equal, that he does more than his fair share of the work. So actually speaking of feminism, her as a mom of seven and at the height of her career, she is a very interesting example of how a woman can have it all. Is that good for feminism? What do y'all think? I she doesn't think have it all if she has to defer to her husband all the time. I don't think she, she talks about how she defers to her husband, how he is the head of the family. That's not all. If I you don't have to say that, you don't have it all. No, you don't. I also don't think she's at the height of her career. What has she done? She's like been a judge for three or four years. She's, she's been mediocre. Like if you think of Justice Breyer, Elena Kagan, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they were Sonia like, even, Sotomayor. Right. Even Barack Obama was, um, you know, law review, the head of the law review at where was he? Um, Harvard. Harvard. Yes. Yeah. So first okay. black, I don't the, first, the first so, black, the first African American of right. the Harvard Law Review. She should just run around listening to her husband. Well, I have a career meaning she's home. a circuit like judge home. on the U.S. Court of Appeals. She's a professor at a top law school and now a Supreme Court nominee. She's it's, a Supreme well, Court appointed nominee. by who? Consider the source. She's a well, Supreme anyone Court. Anyone that he appoints, we already know they ain't shit. I'm sorry. Right. Trump right. appointed you. You work for Trump. He appointed you. We know good and goddamn well. You would not be good enough in some other administration. Just you look at Clarence Thomas. Thank just, you. Look, just look at Clarence Thomas. He has not uh, authored uh, a, a profound dissent since he's been on that court. He's mm -hmm. been mute. He's been quiet. And so just because he was appointed to the Supreme Court doesn't mean he's worthy. Just because Amy Coney Barrett it has this opportunity, uh, that doesn't mean that she earned it. Uh, it's it's kind of like using like Nikki Haley to say Trump you're not racist. It's like using Ben Carson to say Trump you're not racist. It's like using Her Herman McCain, Herman Cain, rest in pepperoni, pour some uh, tomato sauce and mozzarella on the ground for him. It's having a shield to say you're not a bad person. So uh, and, it's, and it's disgusting to use people that way. Right. So to use your people as props. Yeah. So Kellyanne Conway not qualified. Uh, you know, uh, um, 
Kelly, you know, uh, Kaylee McEnany, she came from TV. She's not qualified. So just by elevating a non-qualified person, that doesn't mean they've deserved it. It Thank just you. means they're good at publicity. So it's kind of like those comics that bomb on stage, but they have a lot of followers. That's what Amy Coney Barrett is. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we actually wanted to end this segment on a lighter note. Dyer, so, speaking of comics bombing, do you guys have a funny bomb story or just a crazy funny story to share from your, your time as a comedian? I don't think any bomb I have uh, can beat uh, Trump's bomb. I did stand up and then I stopped for a long, like 13, 14 years. And then I started stand up again, opening my show. But when I started did stand up the first time, I bombed this one club, bombed at Catch a Rising Star, and then I went to Boston Comedy Club the next night. The guy who saw me at Catch a Rising Star bomb came to Boston, he goes, look at you. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't suck this time. Like, look at you, that was great. And I was like, God, do you remember me from last night? Like, he was like, yeah, I go and I, I, I follow people. And I was like, I bombed. <laughs> I bombed, like I had like a panic attack in the ladies room afterwards. Cause I was like, this was a horrible experience. But let me tell you something, it's refreshing as hell to bomb. Cause you're like, wow, I, I've been, I've been to hell and, and I'm, I'm fine. You survive it. Okay, this is my bad bomb story. I was at Stand Up New York and I was supposed to close the show. And it was a very small show. It was a dinner winner. There were four people in the audience. But I went out, I was having a good time with my four people. And all of a sudden, this storm of people just come in like two minutes before I was supposed to wrap up my set. I'm onto my last joke, my closer is gonna get them good, gonna go home, drink my Milo and eat my instant noodles. You know, that was how I was gonna end the night. Then all of a sudden, 60 people come into Stand Up New York and like, what the fuck is going on? And now they're ordering drinks because there's a two drink minimum. Oh God. Me away. And I was like, what is going on? And then I am not getting the light. Like, I'll still be done in two minutes. I had to go on for 20 <laughs> more minutes. I was out of jokes. I didn't know what else I was supposed to do. I didn't know what was going on. And then finally, I got the light. And, and I was like bombing towards the last part because it's just 60 people not listening to me, just chattering all over <laughs> and just not knowing what the fuck was going on, right? And I get off stage and I realize, oh, Jerry Seinfeld had just tweeted that he was going to take in the stage uh -huh. in Stand Up New York impromptu uh -huh. and he had tweeted it. And so everyone in the Upper West Side had come and I bombed right in front of one of my comedy heroes. That was the worst oh. bomb I've ever had. It was just embarrassing. Yeah. I am I am so sorry. That that, <laughs> that sucks. I feel, I feel like rich, wealthy comics, when they bump the rest of us, they should like say, uh, you know what, here's a hundred bucks. Or uh, <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna book you on my next show because it's so hard when the audience doesn't want you. Yeah. To go go up. The the only place that I've seen like Dave Chappelle audiences are a little different. They're like down for whatever. So even if you put someone up and they're like you know, okay. They seem to like want to laugh, but everyone else who's like there for someone, they're like, mm -mm, no, I, I don't, I don't want you. That's yeah. so hard. I did see a, a comedian I really admire, Gria Barnes, have to follow a, a show at the Comedy Cellar where a bunch of guest comedians had dropped by. It was John Stewart, Ray Romano, Louis oh, C. Wow. Before his fall, and and the bookers still made him close the show. He's like, do I have to close the show? I can just like not even take the money. And she goes, no, you have to close the show. And so he goes up and he says, no name after all these stars. And he goes, yay. <laughs> and that just got the whole crowd on his side because they were feeling what he was saying too. So I, ha I have two very quick bomb stories. Uh, I was uh, featuring for Greg Proops and his audience is amazing. They're smart, he does feminist material, he like makes fun of himself as a white person, he's like well-dressed, he treats the staff great, he always has weed. Greg Proops is amazing. But um, he had to cancel the shows and then rebook. So the people that came to the rebook shows had original tickets for something else or they didn't know who he was. So this one night, the audience was not a Proops audience. They were very bridge and tunnel and so I, I'm doing all the stuff that I know works and they're just not responding. So I turn on the audience, I make fun of them. The comics yeah. in the back are laughing, uh, but you know, I'm not doing well. I'm just only doing well because I'm, you know, taking the piss out of them. 
afterwards I was like, oh my God, I'm just gonna go home. So I went home and I came back the next day and I saw proofs and I go, you know, I'm so sorry. That was your audience as a headliner. Like I had no right to go and be shitty to them. And proofs, you know how he is, he's wonderful. He goes, oh, those guys, I don't care but you're my friend. So even if you bomb, it's okay. It's totally okay. Cause sometimes they're not your crowd. Yeah, but sometimes they're just not your crowd. Stanhope before, and Doc Stanhope has a very rowdy, very raucous um, audience. And he even told me, okay, I'm standing behind you. I'm, I'm going to be waiting behind the curtains. If they get too rowdy, I'll come up and shush them up. So he was who very good to me as who, who did, Doc Stanhope. Oh yeah, that's great. That's amazing. Yeah. So the the one thing that I learned um, early on, actually from Jessica Kirsten, and I tell everyone when I teach about comedy, you don't learn anything from killing it. You only learn from bombing. So when people are performing and they're like, I want to get the tape after. If I do well, I want it. If I do poorly, I don't want it. And I'm like, no, if you do poorly, you should take it so you can study it and see what you did wrong and learn from it. So to wrap it up for- I disagree with that statement, by the way. You can learn from killing too. You can see what you did right. Well, but you already know it because you're doing it. Sometimes you don't know it consciously though. You know, let me go out on a limb. I think you can learn from being mediocre all the time because th those are the people <laughs> that are That's getting- That's you become special. nominated for the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> yes. So Word, that gets you nominated. So yeah. What do you think? What are, you, what are your takeaways from Trump and Biden, what they could learn from their- Stand up performance. <laughs> well, the, uh, the takeaway Joe needs to learn how to shade. He needs to learn how to shade. You learn how to shade from the side. I'm telling you, shade will serve you in your life. And he needs to learn how to shade. It takes the piss right out of the whole situation. I think Joe needs to learn from the new age types. I'm in Portland, it's very new age here. He needs to visualize himself in the pink bubble of light <laughs> and the shield between him and Trump. <laughs> Honestly, like I, I think that what we learned is these debates are, are antiquated and they don't fit our new age. And Chris Wallace and Joe Biden were trying to be rule followers and Trump is not a rule follower. I think that these debates have to be reimagined, kind of like how comedians went from doing stand up to outdoor shows to Zoom. These these presidential candidates need to be shaken up and do something different. So the format is my enemy, not necessarily Joe Biden. I think uh, Joe needs to do a better job, like Holly was saying, but also he can't be rattled. He can't let Thank you. Trump rattle him. Yeah, he exactly. was cool a few times. And that was, I'm so, you know, as, as low as uh, Trump was, you know, Joe Biden went low. He, you know, he called him a clown. He told him to shut up. It was unpresidential also. Um, so he needs to go higher. And I think Trump just needs to stop. I mean, the name calling and the, the unpresidential behavior. And he needs better facelift tape. Because <laughs> that's all that broke in New York. Also, I don't know if y'all know this, but Joe Biden has a stutter. And in certain yep. situations where he's under stress, it will come out a little bit. So at yep. first I, I thought, how come he doesn't sound as articulate as I thought he would be? And it's because I think he was under all that stress where a little bit of his stutter was coming out. I agree. And I think that under normal circumstances, like if it was John McCain or Mitt Romney, they would have handled it differently. But Trump is fine going after people who have overcome addiction, overcome a disability, a brown person, a Muslim person. Trump doesn't care. So... Even if you have a speech impediment, it's really important. Like he, he might need to like figure something else out because this person doesn't respect anyone. I, I was thinking um, also, Daya, from our, our last show, I put a clip on um, YouTube about the fires and what he said. And I thought it was really funny when he, when he was talking, not funny, it was kind of sad. When, when he was talking about the fires and the underbrush, and this is another part, part where he laughed. It's like, it's like Tinder there. Yeah, like someone just has to like, drop a cigarette and it all goes up in flames. And I'm like, drop a cigarette? Like, who's dropping like, a cigarette? Only, uh, your, only your whore ass girlfriend. I mean, like, those are federal uh, Just your whore ass girlfriend. I agree. I agree with Felicia on two on two things. One, no one in California smokes cigarettes. We're all vaping. Secondly, <laughs> I thought it was drop a vape in the forest. <laughs> uh, Trump was like, didn't Trump say, "Clean the forest, clean it, clean the forest"? Like, that, like he even knows what that is. But they're federal forests. They're, it's his and, job. And Joe didn't catch that. Joe said nothing. I was like, yeah. ah. There's something really important that we didn't get to, and it's when Trump. 
uh, said, you signed the crime bill. You called black people super, super predators. predators. At which uh, Biden didn't say super predators, but he he was part of the crime bill, as was every other Democrat during that time. Yes. It would, it would have been a good chance for Joe Biden to reach out to black people during this time and be like, and say, oh, how we learn from our mistakes. Right. I, I made a mistake and I learned from my mistake. That's an adult. That's a leader, someone who, because first of all, good experience comes from, good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of like he learned. And you're yes. right, Diet. that should have been his time to reach out to the black community. Right. And then Trump would have said, do you want a president that makes mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, this has been Broadish. Thanks for tuning in to our first ever live episode on Facebook. Hope to see you all next time and have a, a day of healing today. Thank <laughs> you. I need it. Thank Bye. you.